So let's start with introductions. Let's start with you, Yanni. Just a brief introduction of yourself and the and the company. Well, I knew I shouldn't sit in the, this seat, but <laughs> so happy happy to start. Uh, Yanni Nokkanen, I'm a Chief Investment Officer at Inrip. Been with the company 15 years, responsible for our investments and investment strategy. Inrip is uh, roughly 20 billion AUM, Northern European focused real estate manager, developer and investor. Our task is to make the cities succeed with the urban transition. There's a huge problems with the current cities, with urbanization and sustainability, and we are there to help. And we do believe that that's also good business. Perfect, Clemens. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Clemens Brennickmeyer, Head of Sustainability at Redevco. We are uh, an international investor and asset manager, uh, also in the urban environment. Um, our mission is also to help cities become more livable and sustainable. So I have a, uh, we have a, a colleague here who, who is very much aligned in what we're trying to achieve. Um, we have about uh, 10 billion of assets under management uh, across Europe, um, and it's primarily still retail real estate, but looking very much to diversify more into mixed use um, and, and urban, uh, so residential urban logistics, and, and really pushing and driving the sustainability angle and impact angle to the asset management activities that we do. That's great. Uh, because I think the, because the sound outside is beginning to rise at the moment, if we can hold our microphones a little bit nearer, I don't know whether you can hear, I hope you can anyway, but th that will help us a little bit. Excellent, very good. <laughs> Sorry, Elspeth. Hi, I'm Elspeth Crispo. Uh, I'm Head of Innovation at Redefco, and you just heard all about this from Clemens. Clemens and I basically team up because we have a, a challenge to, uh, um, to fight uh, uh, and, and we do that uh, together. So um, yeah, Clemens is responsible for sustainability and I'm responsible for innovation. And we really see innovation as a means uh, to accelerate on our mission uh, to contribute to livable and sustainable cities. Great, thanks. Daniel. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Daniel Chang, and I'm the European lead for ESG at Heinz. Um, I've been with the firm for 23 years, half of that as a construction and development manager, the other half as a portfolio manager within the investment management team, which is where I started to really lead the ESG strategy for several of our investment management uh, funds, uh, and now uh, uh, have uh, really been dedicated to ESG for the European platform. Heinz, um, if you haven't come across this, is a privately held global firm with roughly 285 cities in 28 uh, countries with an AUM north of 80 billion. Um, and uh, for us, ESG really is uh, one of the main priorities um, in terms of, on the one hand, decarbonization, whether that's through operations or through embodied carbon. And on the other hand, also really focusing on creating human-centric spaces, whether that's for our occupiers or for our communities. Um, so Heinz just um, also communicated our net zero target in operations by 2040. Um, and in terms of our uh, projects, we uh, often like to engage in large, complicated master plan projects in the middle of cities. So really coordinating very much with the cities on taking those forward and having an ESG agenda for them. Great, thanks. So um, we've got a variety of different experience here on the panel, um, and that makes it really interesting for us to be able to pick out, pick out on some of the insights that you've got. Um, Clemens, maybe just starting with you. Um, obviously, we've got creating sustainable and livable cities, um, but I suppose let's start with definitions. I mean, for you, what does that mean? Yeah, so uh, it's how do you create and curate places where people want to come and spend time, where they want to live, work, shop, play, um, and ultimately just you know, sustain a, a thriving economic activity in a city. That's fundamental to, to you know, what a, a, a livable city is. And sustainable, uh, you know, that angle is not just on an environmental perspective, how do we make sure that the impact on the environment is minimized, um, but also how do we make sure that we are securing and, and driving positive social impact. You can't do it you know, without a real thought for uh, you know, all the people in a city. It, it, it is about making sure that everyone is brought along and everyone gets to benefit from a, a thriving, uh, vital, dynamic uh, environment. Okay, good. I'm going to set a ruling as well, which is you don't need to wait for me to ask a question. Feel free to come in. And that is also the same for everybody here. Um, and if you're joining us on the, on the live stream, you can also put one in the Q&A and I'll try to make sure that we, we deal with that. But the joy of us being live here is we can ask questions and at least try to answer them, which is the important thing. Um, Yanni, let's, let's, let's start with you. I mean, 
the EU declared there are, you know, I think almost a thousand cities or something like that where there's action that needs to be taken. Um, I suppose, where do you see us at the moment and where have we got to get to? Are we behind schedule? Are we sort of, you know, how do you see that? Because I know that there's been a, there's been a focus um, with you on, on working with the C40 cities in trying to accelerate things. So I suppose, where do you see us at the moment? Well, big question. And uh, first of all... Uh, Every, everyone's here for the big questions, Yanni. Yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> let's start with the fact that the majority of the people are already are in the cities and in few t few tens of years, 70% of the people are, will be in cities. That's where the problems are and that's where the problems need to be fixed. And there's a multitude of problems that we have. It's a social problem, so it's a sustainability problem, affordability problem. Um, so we could spend uh, all our talking different ones. But I'll, I'll pick one that is closer to my heart, which is the sustainability. Uh, we have a climate crisis that we all know. And that needs to be fixed in cities. Uh, it will not be fixed by governments or government policies. It will be fixed in cities uh, in cooperation with private sectors like us. Uh, where are we today? Uh, I think we, are, we have come a long way with the recognition that something needs to finally happen. There's no news. I mean, we have known the problem for tens of years. But now in the last few years, real action is being taken and there's a belief that you can take action and can change. Frankly, we are late. That's the sad story. The 1.5 decrease with Paris, that will not happen. Uh, we've lost that. That's, that's a common lie that we are telling to each other. The question is, what can we do to mitigate that problem? But let's, let's forget that we can keep in 1.5. No, we cannot. We need to fight very hard because it's going to get very difficult in cities. Some of the cities will be swallowed by sea. Some of them will be unlivable. So we are talking about happiness and affordability, but there's a real crisis looming which needs to be addressed. And I think now there's a recognition that we need to do and there's willingness. What is lacking is the political will to take execution and prioritize. And I would say that that is the biggest problem that we see with the cities is that they know what needs to be done, but they are unable to prioritize. So there's, there's a always economical and other topics, and uh, the climate does not come first. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and, and just looking at, uh, I, I suppose, Elspeth coming to you, I mean, looking, looking at the innovation side, I mean, because plainly now, I mean, it's interesting that there's, you know, discussions that we had at, at COP26, for example, was one of the issues was trying to, trying to make it plain that there was a climate emergency rather than just something we should start thinking about, that actually there was a, that now we had to move forward with things. Um, how much does innovation play a role, technology play a role in this? How much of it is already there um, and, and needs to be, a, a, you know, it's an adoption question. I mean, you know, what's happening at the moment? Well, I think innovation really is an enabler to, uh, to combat uh, climate change, and we really should look at it from that perspective. I think there's a lot of technology out there. There's uh, um, a lot of, well, clever people trying to find the right technology uh, uh, to solve elements uh, that either mitigate uh, climate change or help um, adaptation. I think the biggest issue is how do we actually apply the technology? How do we, well, allow ourselves to test it and create the ability to implement and then ultimately scale it? Uh, because technology is there and, and the clever minds that can build new things to solve these uh, issues, they're there as well. But there needs to be, well, I don't know, to some extent a bigger willingness to actually want to do it. And we need to look at well, business cases from a different perspective, processes from a biggest, uh, different perspective. Because sometimes, you know, uh, technology can potentially solve something, but perhaps we're, we're too risk averse with, uh, with, uh, with the re in the real estate sector and even bigger than that, uh, to try and see if, it's, if it actually uh, uh, will be part of the solution. And then the ability to scale on top of it. So it's really about the process. Okay, good. Jani, you wanted to come back on that and then I'll, yeah. I'll pick up with you, Daniel. And Yes, um, I think Elspeth had it right. The technology is there. And the big issue is that many people are saying that we, we need to wait for technology to solve us. No, the technology is there. You can do it. The money is there. So it's a huge amount of capital to invest. And I would claim that the financial 
uh, equation is there. This is also smart business. And I know that there will be people who will, uh, will challenge me in this, but we, we've proven it. This makes sense financially. So the question now is, why doesn't this get happen if, if I'm right, the tech is there, money is there, and the financial case is there? And I think it's as Elspeth said, it is about the mindset. It is about getting things done. It's the prioritization that I mentioned. And this is the sad part, that we can solve this. And we saw it in COVID, when, when we jointly decide to get things done in COVID, we solved a massive issue in a few years. If we could put that focus into this question, I think we could take a giant leap. It'd be good to get your, you know, because yeah. you mentioned at the beginning, the working with cities, the collaboration side of that. Whereas we're almost hearing a, a, a different view from that, Daniel. So what's your perception of it? Well, I'd love to sort of on the back of what uh, Danny and Elspeth have mentioned, I think that um, the industry has really laser focused in the last few years on carbon, I think probably to Yanni's point, not quickly enough, but it has with the fact that a lot of the you know companies, tenants have all declared a net zero commitment. And I do think that they're now having made that commitment, maybe retroactively thinking, okay, now what do we need to do to implement that? How do we get that done? And who do we need to coordinate with? Is it you know our tenants? Is it their communities? Is it the cities? Is it the state? And so that I think is now the mindset of a lot of the players. And I think you know in terms of innovation and tying into that in terms of some of the platforms like data strategies that are going to be fundamental in terms of delivering that you know net zero commitment in terms of just being able to monitor then manage what you're able to capture in through that technology. So I think there is a focus on finding that and adopting that innovation. There are maybe too many different um, innovations out there, so it's about then zoning in on, on the ones that are the right ones and the most effective ones. Um, but I think that, that that is where the industry naturally is at this point. Um, in terms of you know, the opportunities of en engaging then further with um, the larger stakeholders, I think that um, is something that also is the natural next step to engage, for example, with our occupants. You know, in our buildings, occupants make up the majority part of, 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 of the building in terms of the consumption. Um, and so being able to collaborate with them um, is going to be really crucial as a next step and using the innovation to do that. Um, and then with the cities as well, or even, you know, the local governments to be able to focus on harnessing that collaboration at a, at a building level, but then within the way that that building sits in its community and harnessing those data points, I think is going to be really crucial as a next step. Okay, good. Clemens, yeah. And maybe one additional thought is that maybe one of the reasons why it's not being a, you know, taken up as quickly as it should is because of you know, the incentives not being aligned in the right way. You know, we still have too many parties in the market that, that unfortunately are still driven by very short-termist uh, incentives and the investments that need to take place with the technology that's available um, it will have a slightly longer payback period. I mean, I'm also convinced that the payback period is there, but you need to have a slightly longer term perspective. And that for a lot of parties is still today um, scary. Uh, it's out of the comfort zone uh, and just the incentives aren't aligned to look at that long term perspective. So we mustn't forget that that's you know, just part of the, the behavioral change that needs to happen is we need to look longer term. And uh, Elspeth, I'd like to pick up with you. I mean, obviously, if we'd have had this conversation last year, we would have been talking, uh, I guess, you know, still about carbon neutrality, um, but, but energy would have been a slightly different conversation. It would have been, you know, we, we would like to be moving towards new energy, obviously differences with, you know, things like Glasgow moving to hydrogen for, for their transportation heating systems, but we didn't have the energy crisis that we've got at the moment, which has really brought this into, into sharp focus. So has that, has that been a change in terms of people's perspective and do you think that will drive more change? What's your sense of that? Well, absolutely. Uh, I think, well, again, uh, uh, financial situation is a driver for, for change and uh, I think um, it, will, it will definitely accelerate uh, the movement to do something about it uh, at the other uh, well like COVID you would you would want uh, um, it to have like a permanent impact like like we would really change that mindset but it keep it, it, it seems like we keep bouncing back and there's always a reason not to go as fast as we could go uh, the market is changing because of the energy crisis so I'm just on the one hand yes it drives us to becoming more sustainable on the other hand there's there's 
from the energy crisis, there's a financial, well, bigger financial risk. So does that mean we're going to slow down? And I would like to create the exact opposite to solve the energy crisis as well as the climate crisis. Good. Yanni, you wanted to pick that up and then... Yes, I, I, I think this is the only thing that is positive about Russian invasion to Ukraine is that this is speeding up the transition. As an example, look at Poland. You don't have proper district heating and you are burning Russian gas. Earlier, when we were pushing that, no, we need to cut the greenhouse gases, so we need to use different technology. It was a bit like somebody said, the incentives are wrong, so the local developers were just about the short, short-term profits. Now the discussion is different. Who wants to burn Russian gas? Nobody. So now it is much more easier to push that maybe there are solutions, so maybe we should look at geothermal or heat pumps also in Poland, which is not the, what they have done earlier. So this, I, I think we should not miss this opportunity to push the transition even though it is a catastrophe for, for, for a lot of people. But let's use this for something positive. Daniel, you want to pick up? Yeah, no, I'm completely aligned with what's said. And I think, um, you know, very clearly the tenants more than ever are feeling the pinch and really, you know, being thoughtful around how they are occupying their spaces and more than ever in tune with making sure that the, you know, lights aren't on at, you know, past a certain hour or on the weekends or little things like that, which maybe in the past were less meaningful now have a real cost motivation. So I think that collaboration with those occupiers will only strengthen because there's a sort of, uh, a, you know, a common, common cause, if you will. I think on the other spectrum as well, in terms of the thought of then as an industry working towards uh, more focus on renewables, uh, I think is, is tangible as well and looking at the viability and commercial viability of, of on-site renewables, I think will be um, now um, accelerated. Uh, partially hopeful, wishful thinking, but, but I think there is a proper motivation for that. Um, and it's interesting because obviously the, the energy discussion has moved on to being about resilience in some ways as well. And uh, you know, certainly over the, over the sessions we've had here as well, what's been creeping into the conversation that hadn't been before is things actually about the physical resilience of the building to climate change. And that hasn't really been part of the topic. So it'd be interesting to get your views on that. And is that going to be also something that maybe brings it top of mind to people that this isn't just about something that's good for the planet, but actually you're going to have to change that building um, because it's not going to be resilient to the climate change that we're about to see. Yeah, and unfortunately, legislation is also pushing in that direction, right? So that's a good thing. Um, physical resilience is, is absolutely top of mind, at least for us at Rodevco. We, you know, we've been using BREAM uh, for 15 years now and uh, working to continuously improve assets one by one, continuously raising the ambition, uh, looking at you know, all the different facets of, of how you drive uh, you, you know, the environmental performance, but ultimately also um, making sure that the asset is, is, uh, you know, is thinking about flood risk, is thinking about, um, you know, security of, of energy, but is also thinking about biodiversity and, and health and well-being for the occupier. You know, these are all aspects that, that are encapsulated in BREAM. And, you know, let's be fair, BREAM is also not perfect, but it, it's, it's a good tool to use. Um, and, and I think the investor world is is very clearly starting to look at you know, physical uh, asset resilience as an important uh, indicator for, you know, what kind of capex am I going to have to spend on this in the future if it's not done already? And, and feeding that into to capital value uh, is, is becoming more the norm. And if you haven't done it already, you're going to have to do it uh, before you can even uh, transact on a building uh, because, you know, investors in the future, they'll just demand it. Um, and I just want to pick up a little bit in terms of digitization, Elspeth. I mean, you know, we had a big focus on that. There was a session on, on prop tech, for example. Um, and, and I guess, how can that be used in order to improve performance? Um, you know, are we looking at requiring to have much more data? I mean, there was mention there around the sort of data about what's inbuilt car you know, carbon within the building that there is, much of which is not necessarily there for an older building, for example. So is that a role for, for data there and being able to, I suppose, help us improve performance and understand better the buildings that we've got? Uh, massively, I would say. Uh, it, there's a, it's a horrible Dutch translation, but measuring is knowing. So you need to know what the performance is in order to be able to improve it. 
Uh, and I think that's a challenge we've picked up, well, quite some years ago in the real estate market already, which is a good thing, but it has proven to be super complicated because uh, metrics are all different uh, uh, per geography, uh, uh, data is poorly structured, uh, uh, it's hard to cleanse the data properly, so it's, it's proven to be super difficult to do it right. Um, but I'm, I'm confident that we, well, it has given us insights so far. Uh, it has, has given us the opportunity to, to set uh, targets and it will ultimately help us to raise that bar and, and set higher targets and more ambition, ambitious targets and to uh, accelerate uh, um, a carbon reduction and, and measure any other thing. Because, well, I think digital uh, uh, and, and data as a result of that uh, can lead us to much more knowledge about data performance. If you use hardware and software together, uh, you know how buildings are being used. Uh, you have also better sides of how you can improve uh, uh, the use of the building uh, and knowing when to shut areas off because they're poorly used or uh, uh, change the fit out because there's no, no need for super small meetings room anymore, but larger or, or the exact opposite. It, it will learn us how we use those buildings, how we use the areas in which those buildings uh, sit, uh, uh, how attractive or not attractive they are. So that insight, uh, um, uh, well, they, they say data is the new gold and that's, that's because of it. So we'll, it will help, yes. Okay, good. Um, Yanni, I know you wanted to pick that up, um, but I also wanted to, to just pick up on the livability side, the livable part of it. Um, because I know in the, the sort of pilots that you're running with the C40 cities, which I think is six pilots or something like that, um, that that's, the, the measurement of that is that it needs to be green and thriving. So I'm interested to know a little bit about that crossover between sustainability, thriving as a city, and livability. Ooh. Let me start with from the data and try to try to connect. Okay. <laughs> so uh, just to say that the data is the one that we need. It's also unfortunately the, our industry is super poor on data. So I unfortunately here I'm, I'm quite skeptic whether we'll get there. We need it uh, for the sustainability agenda. We need to understand how much carbon is going in. Matter of definition, this is a great scapegoat not to do anything because I cannot measure it. So I, I would encourage us to start doing rather than waiting for right measurement. But running the, uh, running the properties, just as Elspeth mentioned, what do we need? How do you optimize it? I.e., how do you save energy? All this is data driven and need to be integrated with the tech. We are very far away from what, where we should be. Now, this is something that is key when we are talking about sustainability. It's how do you build carbon neutral? How do you run it carbon neutral? And at the same time, how do you make it livable? So how do you make it something that people thrive, and with livable, there's a different definition. What, what does that mean? Is it about health? Is it that it's nice? It is, it is beautiful? So what, what does that mean? Uh, in the end, you need to be able to combine this. Again, data, that is something that you need because none of the projects is the same. So you should always understand what is the property, where you are, what's the need, which is the difficulty. There is not just one framework to make a building or city livable or a city block. There's always need for data and research what is needed here. I, I guess you guys are very good at this. It works at the individual buildings. It becomes even more important when, when we are talking about cities or city blocks to understand what does livability and improving livability in this city mean. And just as an example, if you are in a challenged neighborhood, it is completely different if you are in a rich neighborhood with, with different health problems. Different data, different tools. Okay, good. Clements, do you want to pick that up a little bit? But also, um, just in terms of things that we are doing and can do, um, I, I wanted to also just, just look a little bit about the different types of construction because we're beginning to see more of a focus on um, wooden buildings, more sustainable construction, and I know that you've also got Built by Nature, which sort of taps into that idea. Yeah, so, you know, fully with you, that uh, Yanni, that it's, it's, on the one hand, it's about, okay, how do we construct sustainable cities? And there's a lot of, you know, innovation happening there in terms of, you know, construction methods, uh, building materials. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of interest at the moment and a real push to say, how can we increase the use of mass timber? Um, you know, as, a, as an alternative to, to steel or, or cement or, or concrete. 
um, because of just the, the, the carbon emissions that are associated with that. Now, is timber uh, you know, a silver bullet? No, of course it isn't. Um, you know, we can't start building everything in timber and nothing more in, in steel or, or concrete. Um, but we can start to do more hybrid construction. We can start to uh, experiment. We can start to demonstrate um, that there is a, a sort of a, you know, a carbon payback for doing things differently. Um, there's also research that is showing that actually doing more in timber has positive side effects on the, the sort of the, the health and well-being uh, perception of occupiers. Uh, so for offices, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of evidence that, that, that says, you know, productivity goes up, absenteeism goes down. Uh, in a timber building, um, you know, that starts to actually have a real economic uh, benefit. And, you know, understanding that and, and making deliberate choices on, on that front is, uh, is where, you know, at least some of the, the investment world will, will, you know, will take us. Um, just briefly on the, the Built by Nature initiative you mentioned, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an accelerator fund to basically promote the adoption of mass timber in the built environment. And it is, you know, it, it, it tries to, to find projects to help demystify some of the challenges um, and, 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 you know, encourage pilot projects, you know, more projects out there that, that demonstrate that it does work, that there's a, a, a good financial business case, that it has positive, uh, you know, environmental uh, credentials, but it also has positive social impact. Um, and, you know, we're starting uh, to, to also now do this and use these, uh, these ideas, and these concepts in our own projects. So we have a project in, in Groningen in the Netherlands where we're um, going to be adding uh, a few floors of uh, residential on top of uh, um, a retail store and that, that superstructure is going to be out of timber. And we've also bought a, a plot in Glasgow uh, where it's currently a sort of a rundown health uh, uh, center, sports facility. Um, we're going to create uh, three, uh, you know, new buildings there, all residential, and the intention is to do that all out of mass timber. And you know, we'll learn through those uh, examples and, and see how we can, you know, use the insights and, and the learnings to apply that again into future projects that we do elsewhere in, in our portfolio, and hopefully, you know, inspire others to, to recognise that these are good business cases and, and, and pick it up as well. Great. Daniel, do you want to pick that up, both in terms of the livability side, I think, as well, but also the, the, the kind of construction side? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, on the livability side, as it has been mentioned before, I think um, that is a challenge in terms of measuring, because what metric do uh, you decide to measure? And is it you know relatable across the board from one project to the other? So I think that is a challenge. And I think you know, we all are seeking to, to, to align on that. And I know there's, there's the EU social taxonomy that's going to seek to also, uh, you know, prescribe a little bit more for everyone what, what we should be focusing on. But I think we're all focusing on it, but potentially not in, in a comparable bench, uh, in a way that can be benchmarked. Um, in terms of the carbon side, I think it's a little bit more straightforward. I mean, we have tools now like CREM for operational target uh, that, 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 that will help us to, to sort of uh, understand what we need to do and, and how to, you know, uh, talk about it. The other side of the coin in terms of carbon on embodied carbon is something that uh, we have more information on, but still there's a lot of work to be done. And that's something that Heinz has been working on uh, as a firm. We um, um, wanted to get our heads around it and work together with engineers and put together an embodied carbon playbook, which we've now made available um, on our website, which is I think a, a very succinct, clear uh, guide in terms of some of the set, a setting of standards that need to be um, understood in the industry in terms of uh, environmental product labels and what that means and how you define them. And so that um, guide is, 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 a, is a helpful way to engage with the industry and with your contractors, for example. Um, and so, you know, laying out not only those standards, but also the, the way through which you should think about, you know, reducing certain materials, um, thinking about um, the choice of materials, um, like Clements was talking about, timber uh, is something also that we're focused on as a product line. Um, and then thirdly, really with that data, making or creating a competitive environment across the, the industry or the contractors to try to not only come in with the most effective price, but also most effective um, carbon, carbon footprint. So I think that is um, a lot of work that's ahead of us, but I feel like in that aspect, at least there's more information now that we can all latch onto and, and focus on. Okay, good. Um, are there any questions from anyone in the audience? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue this sentence uh, until I get to the end of it. If I've got to the end of it and nobody's put their hand up, I'll assume there are no questions. 
There is one. There we go. You see, I knew there would be. Let me, uh, let me, let me, can I borrow that a second? Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Stefan Tomek, and um, I'm an expert in, uh, in uh, development uh, under the theme, uh, health, what is a healthy, what is a healthy property? I'm a, a medical doctor who went into business uh, in refurbishment and renovation many years ago. Just for as an example, um, this is uh, a, a very big grand hotel uh, in Austria, Salzburg, where I uh, decided that all energy is coming from the valley through water power. So, um, I think the biggest problem is that about, I think, it, please correct me, 80% of all properties are old properties. It's, it's not difficult, I think, to fulfill the uh, EU compliance uh, and the taxonomy with new buildings. But what about the m most of the things in, in old buildings? And I think as a contribution, as an expert, uh, also accredited as an expert journalist here, um, I would like to give you a little advice. Um, please don't forget the meta theme. What is ecology for, if not for the health and well-being of humans and all living on this planet. I think if you don't forget this meta theme of a healthy planet and a healthy property for healthy people, based on the studies we all have, but nobody knows them, except the experts like us, yeah, what keeps us healthy, then you can't fail. Don't focus so much on paragraphs. Focus on the idea. For a little example, the, the, the most people say it because it's the easiest to reduce the CO2 by changing from gas to electricity or whatever. But what about the social impacts and what about the ethical impacts which are behind, behind the good governance is the ethical aspect. So, for example, systemic thinking. That's what I, ex, uh, I commend. For example, if there's an old property and the most are young singles or old singles nowadays, yeah, and everybody has a washing machine, why not create, instead of 100 washing machines in one building, a wash saloon combined with the kindergarten and the coffee with healthy equal biological food. So just to show where I think the thinking of all experts like you are big names and wonderful and thank you for this audience and for this lounge. Yeah, fantastic idea. That's it. Good. Thank you, Reinhardt. Uh, plainly, I need to get you on the panel next year. Uh, <laughs> um, let's, but I think some interesting points from that, Reinhardt, and we haven't got much time to pick them up, unfortunately, but certainly retrofit, I think, is something important that, that comes out of that. We've, we've, uh, you should have been here for the senior housing session, actually, because there was a big point around that on what do you do with the number of singles, actually, um, and how do you, do you introduce co-living for that? And I think that is important around what you do with um, you know, to, to help bring well-being to different age groups within cities for certain. And I think that is an important point. Sadly, I wish that we'd got a whole entire conference day to deal with these topics. Um, but let, let's just pick up that, just briefly, that point around, I, I think, around the, um, I suppose, how we deal with 80% of the stock. Yeah, and, and thank you very much for your contribution. I fully agree. Of course, it is about dealing with, with the existing assets rather than just new build. I'm not worried about new build at all. Um, I think the, the, it goes to show how important it is that you have to take a holistic view. You have to look at it 
not just from one lens. It's not just carbon. It's not just health and well-being. It's not just biodiversity. You got to look at the whole lot, and and find solutions that that will 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 tackle that at the individual asset level. The challenge, of course, is that ultimately, you know, when we talk about livable cities, you know, we also, as investors in individual assets, can't do it alone. We have to do it together. We have to do it together with like-minded investors, who who club together. And who can help also cities formulate a a, a vision for, you know, neighbourhoods、um, where we each take our bit and do our bit, but that the collective whole is actually driving、uh, the ambition to be, you know, both sustainable and livable. And you know, you can't do it alone. You have to do it together. And that collaboration is going to be key for the next,、uh, you know, decades to come. And then briefly, I think just just a final point from everybody.、Um, I suppose in in terms of.、Um, I guess key goals here,、um, and what are they? And are you optimistic that you'll be able to achieve them? Let's start with you, Yanni. Well, linking that to the previous ones, then、um, I think one needs to prioritize, and the priority number one is the carbon neutrality. Yes, there's livability, there's there's all other things that we would want, but unless we prioritize, this will not get done. So my goal. An ambition is that we decarbonize our industry. I'm optimistic because we have all the tools. So it is people like here who want, who are pushing the industry forward. We need support. We need these kind of panels and journalists. We need investors. So I, I'm optimistic that we will do it. Unfortunately, I think we are a bit late. Okay, good, Daniel.、Um, from my perspective,、um, some of the goals would be also to focus on decarbonization,、um, but also to focus on 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 getting the industry mobilized. So basically, getting, for example, the valuation community on board with actually how do you then incorporate that metric into values? Because at the end of the day, until that happens, it's all a little bit dispersed. And so I think that as well, getting. The broader stakeholders involved. The, I mentioned the occupants before. I think that's happening now with the energy crisis, but I think needs to happen, and hopefully this is the catalyst for that in a more sustainable way over time. And then ultimately also that engagement with the cities and having the cities also and the broader sort of、uh, you know governments involved in that process to really drive. And I think you know some initiatives like we see, for example, in France with the Decret Ciel, where the, that collaboration is required. Is I think going to prove more effective in places where that doesn't exist. So I think those would be the the goals that I would have. Great, Elspeth. Well, part of our mission is is well、uh, contributing to livable and sustainable cities, and I think to really be able to do that, you need to be able to well have that holistic view, but also to to be able to drive that change and try to look at things from a different perspective, because we're going to need that different perspective to to achieve our to to achieve our goals,、uh, and I think. Well, in my role,、uh, uh, being responsible for innovation, innovation should be driving that change. So it's my personal mission to be able to accelerate uh, um, uh, to do that, that change, that、uh, from that bigger perspective. Okay, and final word to you, Clement. Yeah. So,、uh, like it's been said, I agree totally with what Yanni and, and Daniel have said.、Um, we too are optimistic about the things that we would like to achieve. We also want to make sure that we're. You know, having a significant reduction in, in emissions by 2030, on route to net zero 2040, that requires the collaboration.、Um, it requires also the, the the showcases. So, doing the work, taking action, and then sharing that insight, that knowledge, you know, open source, making it available to to the market so that everyone can pick it up. You know, th- this is too important to make it a competitive play.、Um, We need to we need to all accelerate, and、uh, you know I for one,、uh, and I think Redevco's company, we are absolutely open to sharing、uh, everything that we're doing to help everyone sort of really pick this up and and make a difference. And you know we're optimistic that that we can do it together with like-minded partners and and make a difference and have that impact. So great,、um, and just in terms of what we're doing, and also thank you to Redevco for being part of the editorial board for this. Is we launched Impact, which you'll see behind us. Deliberately focused on ESG、um, and and social well-being and those those aspects、um, and the real estate side to help try and drive forward this initiative as well. 